Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. On episode 39, I chat with Jeremy Kipnis about the world's most expensive and complex home theater. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded on October 25th, 2010, episode 39 The Ultimate Home Theater. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here with UltimateAVMag.com and HomeTheaterMag.com. My guest geek this week is Jeremy Kipnis, a home theater consultant and the owner of what I believe is the world's most expensive and complex home theater. Hey, Jeremy, welcome to the show. How are you, Scott? I'm great, thanks. So glad to have you on. Um, I first heard about your theater uh, some years ago. Uh, there was an article, you've had many articles written about it. Just, and just a few. To, just a few. Uh, and just to get us off on the, on the, just off the bat here, am I correct that you're actually written up in the Guinness Book of World Records? In fact, I am. And it's a strange happenstance that after the first article uh, came out in uh, January of 2008, somehow it uh, made its way across the pond and suddenly Guinness was calling me and offering me the opportunity to be in their 2009 issue. So uh, <laughs> I was you know, very grateful to accept and so far it's been three years running now and we're still in the same category as winners. And, and the, that category exactly is? That's the uh, most technically complex home theater and video gaming setup in the world. Ah. And I wonder how you quantify that. John, John, our engineer, asked that off the before we started here. How do you quantify complexity? <laughs> I'm not sure that you can, you know, put a limit on complexity. But apparently, as far as Guinness was concerned, this represented a, a singular event in the history of the field. Well, it sure is, and uh, we're going to get to talking about your theater in a moment, uh, in more, much more detail, and we're going to see some pictures of it as well. But before we get to that, I wanted to start with a bit of your background, because you've actually got a fascinating family history uh, that I would love for you to go over briefly here uh, as we begin. Yes, please. Where would you like to start? Well, let's see. As I, as I recall from the... Uh, from the information you sent me, uh, your great-grandfather was a conductor, pianist, and composer. In fact, your whole family history is one of relatively famous professional musicians. It, it sort of seems strange, but I'm the fourth generation in a long, long history of uh, musicians and people who have been involved in performance. So yes, my great-grandfather on my uh, grand on my father's mother's side was in fact a conductor and a composer as well as an educator and an arranger and he turned in uh, uh, an incredible opportunity uh, when he uh, decided to come to the United States from Poland and teach in Chicago and as a result uh, his daughter turned out to marry my grandfather who was the opera singer. Alexander and Kipnis was a, and in fact a world famous basso profundo opera singer and performed all over the world, um, in, in particular at the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. So, mm -hmm. And he gave rise to my father, uh, Igor Kipnis, who is the harpsichordist and pianist. Right, who I, in fact, have heard of and, and have some records of myself. So you can imagine I've been listening to recordings and uh, classical music all my life, and it's something that's very much in my soul. Uh, and in the same way as, uh, as it was with, with them, but instead of playing a musical instrument, I play technology. <laughs> you play the uh, theater as the instrument. Are you a musician yourself? I am. I'm principally a keyboardist, but I have studied all the different instruments at one time or another. And I've been very, very blessed to uh, meet a number of very famous conductors like Leopold Stokowski and also wow. Arthur Fiedler. And both of them gave me, you know, a little lesson when I was just a youth, but it's something that you remember for the rest of your life. Oh, no kidding. I remember, uh, <clears throat> well, I've got plenty of recordings of Leopold Stokowski conducting Cleveland and, and other orchestras. He was the conductor also on the original Fantasia, of course, which Absolutely. I actually have a, which I actually have a connection to, family connection myself. Do you remember in Fantasia, uh, between the, um, 
uh, animated parts, there were uh, shots of an orchestra in silhouette with Stokowski. I remember it well. Yes. And now, the score was recorded by Philadelphia, but those musicians on camera were the L.A. Philharmonic because they shot that Disney was in L.A., so they used that orchestra for those visuals. And my grandfather was playing in the orchestra in the 20s and 30s, and he is one of those silhouetted guys. It seems like an incredibly small world. Uh, <laughs> When you consider also that, uh, you know, my particular love of classical music and early music is something that you also share, it's uh, quite interesting that we also love home theater and high-end audio. Isn't it amazing? It really is. Your wife is, in fact, a Baroque soprano. and uh, And I am a Baroque and Renaissance musician as well, so uh, you and I have actually quite a bit in common, <laughs> including our love of home theater which now let's turn to yours, <laughs> which far outshadows mine and any other home theater I've ever seen. Um, why don't you tell us what got you, how did you come to install and create this incredible home theater? And while you're talking, I'd like uh, John, our engineer, to perhaps show a few pictures of, uh, of what we're talking about here. Sure. Well, um, having grown up in this family with so many generations of musicians and performers it's not something that you uh, you know quickly forget the the sensation of going to a live concert or a live event and mm -hmm. um, movies used to be so much more than they are today in fact they were treated like a live event and and you may recall that uh, you know early on in the uh, the decade of the 20s uh, there was the very very uh, final horizon of silent pictures but the whole event uh, surrounding a, uh, an evening, going to a silent picture was not exclusive of the movie. It was, in fact, included inclusive of also live events as well at the same place. And there was a degree of grandeur which you could uh, have for a, a small price as opposed to a large price with a live classical uh, ensemble at an opera house. Um, well, certainly, certainly with the silent movies, you had uh, live performers organists at the very least, if not an entire orchestra, playing along with the movie. I mean, otherwise there really wouldn't have been very much sound, now would there? <laughs> so, but starting in 1926, when talkies very first began, that whole era started to slowly come to an end, if you will, the golden era of cinema. And mm -hmm. that grandeur and sense of occasion, I think, has been substantially lost as we've moved closer and closer to the, 20th, uh, the 21st century. And here we are now with not only uh, multiplexes and an attempt at 3D, but with uh, seriously better fidelity coming in most people's home theaters than you'll see out in the, out in the field. Mm-hmm. And so you, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, wanted to really create the ultimate, the truly ultimate home theater in which to have the ultimate home theater experience. Seems to me that uh, the few places that I've been in the world over the course of the last 40 plus years uh, that stood out in my mind were uh, theaters that had uh, the real sense of occasion. They were great pieces of architecture. They involved great technology and great people running them. And that produced a sensation of picture and sound and a memory, which is uh, indelible. And that's something mm. that to me, all movies have the potential of if you just put the pieces together in the right sequence. Right. Um, let's see if we have any photos uh, uh, yet uh, ready to come up on the video. There it is. Here we go. Okay, so we're looking, tell us what we're looking at here. Well, that's an overhead view from the balcony that's in back of and above the screen. The screen is uh, 18 feet wide by 10 feet tall. And what you're looking at there is the circle of amplifiers, which I, some of which I use in this case to, to power the large tall speakers that you see standing again in a circular array. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, in, at the time that picture was taken, there were 30 of those amplifiers. They were Macintosh MC2102s. And eventually that design reached a pinnacle with 50 of those amplifiers. Oh, man. Now, of course, Matt. it looks as though there's not very much room uh, left over after the speakers and the amplifiers. But, of course, the uh, uh, photography is really designed to showcase an awful lot more than you could actually see in a single glimpse and, and ne necessarily to look good at a small size. So, in fact, the room is really quite large, you know, mm -hmm. upwards of... Um, 30 feet wide, as you see it there, and between the screen and the projection booth uh, is a full 40 feet. And mm. so 
that along with the the double vaulted ceiling where you can see that uh, in back of the screen there's actually a balcony area uh, mm -hmm. which as it turns out is acoustically designed into the room by the original acoustician so as to allow for uh, a much um, more uh, precise bass re uh, representation below 20 hertz. Uh, oh. And that's by increasing the physical size of the room well beyond the actual area in which the speakers occupy. Mm -hmm. So here, here we see a diagram, an overhead diagram of the layout of the room. Uh, with uh, And really you've got the speakers in a circular array around the listener. The listener is in that blue crescent area. Those of you who are watching the video can see what I'm talking about. Correct. And I guess the blue dots are the speakers uh, that basically surround the listener. And I mean, I guess we're really talking surround sound here. We're not kidding around. Well, my, my philosophy as a uh, an audio recording engineer and producer has been that if you're going to reproduce the sensation of being there, you really need to have the sound coming from all directions. And if that's going to be true, it probably should be with all the same equipment, both speakers and amplifiers. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, uh, to get to the next step, which is the verisimilitude with reality, if you will, what I call the mirage effect, you have to go back to scratch, which is to look at the way in which each of the speakers interacts with the air that's between you and the cabinet. And in the final analysis, I spent years working with the different speaker manufacturers and driver manufacturers in order to come up with a solution to one basic problem, which is variations in driver quality. And the hmm. same, of course, with the vacuum tubes that are in the uh, amplifiers. So everything has been hand matched in this particular room, um, all the way down to the um, Romex cables, which were specially commissioned from Cardis Audio, that run from the uh, back of each of the components to an area in the garage where we have separate uh, power stations and uh, 40 amp breakers on each and every one of the amplifiers. Good God. <laughs> uh, now, this leads me to a number of questions. Um, <clears throat> One of which is you obviously prefer tube amplifiers over solid state. Why is that? Well, I, I think that one of the problems that I've realized uh, entering this, um, first of all, as a recording engineer and then as an enthusiast calibrator, uh, is that making a business uh, and explaining what one does is very difficult when the first thing people do is see the pictures and then not read the text. So one of the uh, highlights of this particular design was that I chose to use tubes because as a recording engineer, I wanted this room to be serviceable as a mixing stage. And I didn't want to have any coloration whatsoever. As opposed to but the... Don't, but don't tubes... Uh, I mean, tubes are famous for coloring the sound, making it warm, uh, in, increasing the, the even order harmonics. While, while that is certainly true, I think that there's a big difference between utilizing tubes for effect, as so frequently they are in the case of making music with electric instruments, uh, and actually reproducing an electrical signal precisely, uh, but with amplification. Straight wire with gain, as we used to call it back in the mm. Chesky days. And mm -hmm. so it doesn't really matter from my standpoint if it's a tube doing the amplify, uh, amplification or whether or not it's a, a solid state uh, element. What's really important is that the exact qualities uh, that are in the original source are preserved all the way through to the final uh, amplified signal. And uh, my, my whole reason for starting with tubes is because they are the oldest technology that we've been using uh, for this purpose. And there's mm. a tremendous degree of knowledge uh, which can be read and experienced and then experimented with in order to see whether or not we've gone as far as we can with that particular approach. Hmm. That's interesting. The tubes are, in fact, a more mature technology. We think of transistors as being pretty mature, but in fact, tubes are quite a bit, quite a bit more so. So uh, that argument is uh, quite an interesting one. We have a question from the chat room, uh, which is, uh, are the speakers that you use three-way or four-way? We didn't get a close-up view of them. They're awfully tall. <laughs> what can you tell us about the speakers? Well, these are actually a five-way design, and that's by virtue of the fact that the original uh, Snell THX Music and Cinema Reference speaker was composed of a single one of those subs, not the double-decker tower that you see there in Dapolito configuration. Uh, and it was designed with a left and a right sub, 
two of those towers, the one that you see uh, standing there, uh, and no super tweeter. And while that was a perfectly serviceable design for George Lucas and Tom Holman back in 1998, uh, what it needed is a little bit of sprucing up. So what I did is experiment, again, for years and years, to see what configuration was going to produce the wave front at the listening position that most precisely recreated the recording. And I, I would point out at this time that it's not just audio recordings, of course, but home theater as well, which is why there's a big screen in back of me instead of just a giant pair of speakers. Yeah. Um, in, in the end, I, I think that so many people who work in our industry uh, get to a point of working on product, never realizing the actual value, uh, historically and otherwise, of what they're doing. Take as an mm. example, close encounters of the third kind, which I'm okay. sure we've all seen to death. And <laughs> There were several different mixes that occurred depending upon which release print you saw in 1977. And of course, all the video versions that have come out subsequently on beta and VHS and laser and CD and Blu-ray and so on. And what I've found is that the quality that was uh, distilled by the people at the Criterion Collection when they made a special Laserdisc run of Close Encounters in I think both versions, um, they, they mixed a new soundtrack, which is only stereo and recorded at uh, 44.1 kilohertz, just like a CD, uh, but it is able to be decoded and sound more realistic than even the current Blu-ray that's been in circulation now for, I guess, three years. Mm. Mm. So looking back again, you know, uh, the uh, people who've worked in the industry for a long period of time have a great deal to share. And I've tried very hard in this uh, exploration of what really is the pinnacle of creating a picture and a sound that is the pure illusion of actually being there. A time machine, if you will. Um, the, uh, the relative conundrum has been that uh, everything that's new must be better. So I don't always go to solid state uh, any more than I would automatically go to tube. That would be a, a particular choice on the part of the person commissioning me to design a home theater for them. Mm -hmm. But if mm -hmm. I have a choice, even though tubes are much more trouble and require matching uh, on a fairly regular basis and replacement, uh, given the limitations of tube manufacturing these days, uh, they produce a more authentic you are there sound. And I, I don't mean euphonically or in a colored fashion, but just you close your eyes and everything is laid out in three dimensions, not only in front of you, but all the way around you. And in such a fashion that you can turn your head in any way and at any time while the program is going on and the illusion stays fixed in space just as it would in reality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you, we saw a picture of that, of that one speaker and I think you have that array around the entire room uh, and what's the most predominant feature of it is the stacked dual subwoofers uh, but you also have a second tower there which has all the rest of the uh, um, transducers, correct? Uh, that's correct. So there are actually uh, three elements to each speaker channel. Uh, and so in that photograph, there would be the base element represented by the two Snell sub-1800 passive woofers. Mm -hmm. um, and, bec and because they are the base complement, uh, as in the vocal range that my grandfather sang uh, <laughs> for, some, for so many years, uh, the next level up, of course, would be the... Um, the baritone range, uh, which is those uh, represented by those four drivers that are at the very top and very bottom of the small thin tower, mm -hmm. which, which again is the Snell M and C, uh, again created for uh, and designed for George Lucas and Tom Holman as their very first ex exploration of a home THX system. They mm. wanted to have a, a pinnacle set of speakers that would represent what THX could be in a home. And after much research and development, they finally went to Snell and hired Kevin Vex, who was at that time their chief designer. Uh, Kevin so, Bakes, who has in fact been a guest on my show. What, what a wonderful person he is and an incredible designer. Yes. So his design, of course, basically started with the sub, and then this tower, which again, it has the four baritone speakers, followed by the um, tenor speakers, which are those two mid-range drivers that you see closer to the center. Mm -hmm. And then there are three tweeter elements, uh, which do not all send the same signal out into the room and towards the audience. In fact, there's lower tweeter and higher tweeter. Mm -hmm. And of course, I call that the 
alto and soprano. Not surprising. <laughs> of course, but, not surprising. Uh, however, there is uh, yet another uh, range in human um, voice and singing, which is represented by the coloratura. And that's the name that I've assigned to the super tweeter, which is by <laughs> Murata, which you see there just a little bit to the, uh, to your right of the, uh, uh, of the tower. And that really covers the very, very top range, not only of human hearing, but also dogs, cats, bats, and probably, a, you know, a couple of other, uh, arachnids that I, I don't want to particularly bring up because <laughs> I don't like them. But, the point in this case is to have a, a full frequency transducer for each channel uh, composed of this array of different speaker elements. And together in that configuration that you see, they're able to reliably produce from 10 hertz on up to 100 kilohertz at the listening p position, plus or minus a quarter. And oh of course, quarter decibel is, you know, really pushing it well below the point where most people can measure reliably, much less hear. But... Mm. Uh, if the goal is to, you know, touch the edge, not only of state of the art, of, but what we are capable of perceiving, then, then I put it to you that uh, 10 hertz is physically audible to your body in, in that if you play 10 hertz on a pair of headphones, you won't feel it. And if you play 10 hertz over a pair of speakers, you will. And so there must be something very particular about the interaction of air pressure and the body, which is something that I've tried to... Um, explore, uh, particularly all the way down to the, the supersonic, yeah, supersonic uh, range below 10 hertz. And, uh, sub, um, subsonic, actually, infrasonic. The, 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 the infrasonic range. And what yeah. the infrasonic range has taught me is that our sensation of how large a room is in a recording, and of course the distance of objects being recorded and their relative size, given their distance, is almost entirely uh, a product of this infrasonic range. And so hmm. by reproducing the, the classic range, but below 20 hertz fairly accurately, uh, given the wealth of recordings that have been made in the last uh, 50 or 100 years, there is substantially uh, more information than you've probably heard before. And of a truly visceral nature, and I don't mean just rumble, hum, or, uh, you know, uh, bump, but rather the, uh, the very um, air that was uh, moving between the people who are making the recording or the sound that was being generated and the microphones at the time of the recording. Now, my question on that score would be, is there really information, significant, substantial information below 20 hertz on the recording? Could the microphone actually pick up something below 20 hertz? Well, clearly it depends on the microphone and the era that we're talking about in recording. And so I'm not going to defend every recording as having valuable information even below 40 hertz, much less 80 hertz, considering mm. how many movies are made today that have nothing but clutter that you would just as soon turn the subwoofer off rather than have the room jump up and down. <laughs> but, but in the case of, you know, classical music in particular, which I was, you know, brought up with very, very closely, uh, and jazz as well, um, there's an immediacy about the recording technique that's used in the very best recordings, which is something that I studied with Bob Katz and David Chesky during my tenure at Chesky Records in the early 1990s. Mm -hmm. um, from that standpoint, I, I don't want to ignore any part of the audio spectrum that might possibly offer some degree of you are there quality that cannot otherwise be reproduced. And one of those uh, event horizons for me has clearly been the infrasonic range. Mm -hmm. but and also, also the to, supersonic then as but well. But I also want to point out the supersonic because frequently people uh, associate um, high frequency resolution in, uh, in audio file formats with either um, delusion, um, uh, bad hearing or, uh, you know, some kind of uh, self-pride in audiophilia, uh, rather than people who actually can hear in reality and every day around them frequencies that if they are not clear and loud at, at 15 or 20,000 hertz, you still can tell the difference between a speaker and reality. And for me, the research in the supersonic came when I tried to make recordings of voices and then reproduce them using conventional loudspeakers in a, in a, a normal room. And clearly the coloration that was introduced by both the speakers, the amplification, and the room itself began to annoy me. And I was never able to get beyond that point until I realized, well, first we need to neutralize the room. And then we can afford to have 
truly flat high frequency response. And by truly flat, I am saying all the way out to 100 kilohertz. Not with the purpose of hearing even much past 15 uh, K at this point with you and I, uh, mm -hmm. with our, our wonderfully degrading hearing. But yes. Pre perhaps more importantly, because the research I've done clearly demonstrates that uh, high frequency resolution and the uh, palpability of the sonic image is reproduced uh, most accurately by the fastest possible wavefront that reaches the ear. So if you will, the slew of high frequency information properly reproduced by a super tweeter will overwrite or cover the sound of the slower um, super tweeter elements that are in any speaker system hmm. so the regular regular tweet the slower regular tweeter elements you're talking about if we can call regular tweeters slow yeah right which which we can't really um, but i think that the I point do is I, th yeah. I was going to say the, the point is by having the headroom available to reproduce say uh, 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 a recording that has clear information at least to 20 kilohertz or potentially with dvd audio or uh, an SACD, perhaps even higher you know out to 30 40 even 50 kilohertz that mm -hmm. the sensation of uh palpability and tangibility of any recording is drastically improved and of course recordings that are made in a minimalist fashion uh with sensitivity towards the uh type of mic, the location of the mic, and of course the type of acoustic that's being recorded in uh, is transformative. It, it literally is like being at the recording session when you listen in this room. Well, here's a <clears throat> related question from the chat room, uh, <clears throat> which is, um, what about setting up a small set of stereo speakers for each member of a jazz combo, or even for that matter, a larger ensemble? to audibly represent each musician individually. Well, I, I am, uh, you know, fervently in favor of this, in particular, the closer we get towards uh, recorded live performances, that is, uh, live performances that feature rec uh, recorded music, uh, rather than the actual live ensemble, the greater the need is to have a sound system that can reproduce the authority found in a large live ensemble. So if you were to say record and play back each instrument in any particular recording with uh, one microphone and one amplifier and one speaker and then you arrayed them in such a fashion as to reproduce the proper balances of sound, I think it would be a very, very impressive uh, experience. But it would only Impractical. work... It would be impractical, and even if it were practical, I think the difficulty is for every recording, you have a different number of microphones, amplifiers, and speakers, mm -hmm. and you'd never, be, you'd never be able to get around to listen to anything. But in a, in a perfect world, if you had a perfect sound system, I believe that it would probably be composed of a hemisphere or a sphere of speakers, uh, which in and of themselves is impractical, but living uh, outside the box for a moment, if you're in the center of the sphere of speakers and the sphere itself has no walls as such and represents an anechoic chamber from the you know, standpoint of an, an acoustician, well, then you really would be able to paint a sound field in 360 degrees uh, in three dimensions that could in all likelihood supersede what I have here. <laughs> <laughs> Which would be quite a feat. Uh, for, so let's talk, get back to what you have there. How many audio channels are you running? Sure, there are 96 channels in operation in this room. Good God. How so, many, though that includes separate uh, subwoofer channels and super tweeter channels and so on? Correct. In, in effect, there are eight subwoofer channels. There are eight full frequency channels, which include the base information from 10 hertz on up. And, of course, there is the, the super tweeter channel, which by itself uh, does not constitute a separate audio channel in this room. But I have it available if at some point we had super, supersonic information that happened to be on its own channel. Hmm. In the end, I think what was important in this particular experiment was to see how far I would have to go in order to flesh out that response from my body and and from people who have come here and uh, put down quite a few testimonials that they were uh, awestruck and changed by the experience uh, just of listening to their favorite music. And it didn't matter what it was, because I would say, 
bring your favorite music. I don't care if it's a cassette or an eight track or an LP, God willing, or a CD or a whatever. And when they listen to it, they would routinely say, I have never heard this recording before in my life. And that is a very, very telling thing because obviously we all grow up listening to music over and over and over again. We have our favorites. That's true with uh, films and television and video games for me. And part of the fun of being an audiophile is taking those uh, uh, programs, the media as it were, and listening to it and experiencing it on different systems. But in the end, if you pull out all the stops, as we used to say, uh, you know, it, in Oregon school, um, yeah. it, the, the whole point of why people would have started recording and preserving a history of sound and picture becomes clear. And again, I bring up that concept of a time machine where there are plenty of films and television programs and a lot of music by people who are dead. They've been dead for a long time, but the music lives on, and uh, more so as a result of being able to properly play it back really for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I see a comment in the chat room noticing that you have a model of the, of the submarine Nautilus in your home theater. Is that an, an, an artifact from the movie? Uh, that is a limited edition that was put out, I believe, 50 years to the day that the, uh, the movie actually premiered in theaters. It's made by a company called Master Replicas, uh, and I believe they made a thousand of those, of which, amazingly enough, I was able to acquire a serial number one. And <laughs> the real purpose for doing that is not to say it's serial number one, but because the number one, particularly in, uh, in and related to Jules Verne, uh, is very uh, spiritually significant to me because um, uh, my entire family pretty much were involved in different aspects of music that are not the regular sort of uh, career. So my father being a harpsichordist and then later a pianist as opposed to the other way around, or my grandfather being an opera singer, even though uh, uh, operatic singing was very popular uh, and he was a celebrity at that particular time, it's quite different than the Frank Sinatra, you know, uh, mm. or Jimmy Dorsey of the, of the same period of time. And they would have sold millions of records where he would have sold a million records. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think that the, the Nautilus in particular, uh, it has that, uh, that cresting quality for me, uh, where um, Jules Verne was very interested in looking into the future and seeing where his imagination would take him. And he believed very seriously, I think, in the uh, spirit and capability of mankind. And that's something that I believe in, uh, particularly when it comes to picture and sound recreation, because to some, it's just a $6 movie. But to me, it's an experience where every frame of film or every moment in time that one is listening is an opportunity to reflect and to see where you're coming from uh, anew. And the better the fidelity, I think the more likely that your emotions are to be brought to the surface and some real truth will come out eventually. Uh, mm. Hopefully it will be musical truth and artistic truth and, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've been talking quite a bit about audio, so let's turn to video for a moment. Um, I know that you have in your studio, oh, we do have a question in the chat room, uh, which is how big is the projection screen? You mentioned that earlier, but let's reiterate that. Sure. The, the projection screen is 18 feet wide by 10 and an eighth feet tall. So it's uh, precisely 1.78 and whatever the runoff is um, for a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Um, right. why, did you is, not, why did you not go with uh, 235 or 240? Well, in particular, I, I have great um, experience as a photographer with different aspect ratios. And one of the things that I believe in is what you were talking with Don Stewart uh, about in the previous episode, which is an equal area screen. And mm. that's because I like to watch Star Trek, for example, or con uh, uh, historical television, 20th century television, which is mostly in a four by three aspect ratio as yep. much as I enjoy watching CinemaScope movies or yep. Todd A.O. or Super <laughs> Panavision, for example. Um, mm. And as an experiment, this being a lab, and uh, my, my original intention was, of course, to, to you know, play around, see what's going on, uh, entertain my uh, desires to uh, expand my recording engineer capabilities by uh, uh, building my own microphone. And the net result, of course, is to go in the opposite direction, which is to look at picture. And uh, you sound as the, the other 50% of the motion picture and television experience. Mm -hmm. So 
if I have to choose uh, a, a fixed aspect ratio screen, I choose the one that's in the middle of both of those wide or narrow aspect ratios. And hmm. it works out really, really well, especially if you have an automated zoom. Of course, in a, uh, a client's finished home theater, I would probably recommend getting a multi-masking screen, which is where I think you were uh, uh, making that discussion with Don Stewart. Uh, I was. That, you know, having, having a screen, whether it's curved or otherwise, that always has the border be the border of whatever you're watching is critical. Um, and so in this particular case, uh, if we were to replace this screen, we probably would make, make it wider than it is right now. And instead of being 18 feet wide, it would become a full 26 feet wide, leaving only, uh, what is that, uh, eight feet, you know, four feet left and right on either side of the room. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, th then we get into the, into the, the other issue, of course, which is back to sound, where uh, traditionally, as you know, uh, movie screens have small perforations in them and the speakers are located behind them. And that, of course, is because they were originally intended to be used in very large auditoriums, sometimes with several thousand people. In fact, up to 6,000 if you were going to a very, very large uh, auditorium like the Roxy in Brooklyn, for example, or mm -hmm. Wanamaker's in Philadelphia. Not to mention a whole whole bunch of other great, great movie palaces that no longer exist. It's a great challenge to try and get sound to cover that huge area. And so you're forced, first of all, to use horn loudspeakers, which is not necessary in a smaller environment like this. And in particular, uh, you have to have the sound appear to come from behind the screen for the mass portion of the audience and the only way to do that effectively is to put the speakers behind the screen up until recently and what i've been doing here is to experiment with how do we make sound come out of the screen so that everybody with their eyes open or closed says yes that's exactly where the sound is coming from right out of his or her mouth and not just here but over here you know and over here so particularly going back to the uh, stereophonic uh, recordings that came out in the Cinerama era, where the dialogue actually follows the actor on the screen, sometimes very far into the corners of the screen. That's not done, you know, very much at this point. But when it's done correctly in the mix, here, the way with the sound system is set up, you can precisely hear not only the uh, location left to right uh, of that of that dialogue. So you have one person here, and then maybe you have another person over here. But you can tell that one is farther in front of the other, which is something that usually is completely obscured when you have speakers behind the screen. That sense huh. of so you have no speakers behind the screen. This is not a perf screen, correct? It's not a perf screen. And in fact, I, what I believe is a cornerstone of my work in home theater design, as well as uh, the up and coming professional market, is to utilize the technology differently than it's been uh, seen before. And so there's no reason uh, not to, for example, bounce the sound off the screen make the screen into its own uh, speaker system using uh, not conventional driver technology, but high frequency biasing, for example, or any, oh, of sure. number, any of a number of different, you know, sometimes complex, sometimes obvious and simple solutions, which Hollywood as a rule is not interested in. And movie theaters don't have the money in order to experiment. So they do what they're told. And we should be grateful, in fact, that at the moment, if you got good sound in a theater, you're probably really, really lucky. And if you just got a new Sony projector in that's 4K, uh, you should be really thrilled because it's probably looking really, really great. Better, in right. fact, than most of the DLP that I've seen recently. Right, exactly. And that was my next question, in fact, is I know that you have a Sony 4K projector, which is a digital cinema projector, not something that most consumers would buy except the extreme high end. But again, that's sort of what we're talking about today. So, um, And uh, I, it, one, one debate that is continuing today and I find quite fascinating is that, that I have with Leo Laporte quite often is 3D or 4K, which is really... Uh, more effective at conveying reality. And as we've been talking about this whole this whole show is trying to convey reality as accurately as possible. What do you think? Well, I'm going to refer back to um, uh, a great man who is the inventor of Cinerama, ultimately, uh, and certainly the forefather of the 
format, uh, both as a camera format and as a, a projection format, uh, and that's Fred Waller. Um, and his belief, of course, in the Second World War was that if you wanted to recreate the illusion of reality, you simply use more and more cameras and more and more projectors and more and more screens. And as a result, the intrinsic limitations of resolution for each one of those projected screens becomes a small part of the whole image. Um, that's sort of the nature of uh, the human search for an affordable way to make a high quality uh, projected image. And up until digital, the only way to do that at the level that we're talking about with 4K was with some kind of 70 millimeter film. Um, clearly IMAX uh, offers up to 10 times the resolution of a, a traditional 35 millimeter print, but of course it, there are a lot of other qualities that go into the presentation, not the least of which is how big is the theater, uh, is the lens clean? Is the lens glass to the projection booth clean? <laughs> yeah. little, little things like They're that. Start to and, make a big difference. That's right. And, of course, from my standpoint, how much light is coming out of the projector and what kind of screen gain is involved and what's the shape oh, of the screen? I was so going to ask you, I forgot, what's the, what's the screen material that you're using there in that room? Ah, this is the Snowmat material, uh, which, again, you were talking with Don Stewart about. And what that is is a perfect Lambertian diffuser, which means essentially it's like a very, very well painted uh, neutral white wall that's been sanded to death so that it has no uh, physical uh, surface texture whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so as, as a result, anything that's going on with uh, any projected image, whether it's film or video, is immediately obvious. Also, there is no hot spotting on this screen, in particular, because any light that hits the center and that hits the corners is diffused equally. And so the only time that I see variations in light intensity across the screen from the center to the corners is if it happens in the projector. Uh, and that's something that film projectionists, uh, particularly the ones that worked in places like Radio City Music Hall, turned into an art form so that no matter what print came in, they would be able to reproduce a continuously uh, brightly lit sharp image on the screen at, at any and all moments in time. And that yeah. obviously has been substantially lost up until this very recent foray into digital projection. Right. So getting back to my question, uh, 4K or 3D, which do you think is a better representation of reality? Sure. Um, 3D is gimmicky and will remain so, so long as people continue to treat it as a, an amusement park ride. Um, the whole drive towards 3D really started in the 1890s, right after photography first became a, uh, a commercially successful uh, uh, production, uh, and, in, and movies as well, in no small part due to Thomas Edison. So when I uh, look at the, the options you're giving me, I, I see a world that constantly wants to go back and forth. They want to see 3D, but they don't want to wear glasses and they don't want it to look gimmicky. So mm -hmm. from my standpoint, throwing more resolution at the image, just like the great photographers uh, of the past, say Walker Evans or Ansel Adams, uh, and using plate, plate glass that the, uh, the image is so large uh, that you can look deep, deep into the image, even with a magnifying glass, and continue to see detail all the way down to the film grain. That's what 4K offers us the potential for. But it's mm -hmm. only going to happen if we shoot and edit and master and then distribute in 4K. Otherwise, yes. it remains pretty much the same 1920 by 1080p that we see at home. In fact, it probably is not going to be as good because, uh, in my opinion, um, once you start at, uh, at 4K, you've already spent so much money that, that any improvements that you might have made as a result of lenses and cameras and things is going to be a wash by the time that you're done. And yes, that's just I, a shame. It is. It is. And I've seen 4K. And for those of you who, who don't know this term, uh, 4K refers to the resolution 4,096 pixels across by 2,160 or so down, roughly, 4K by 2K, as opposed to 1920 by 1080 or 1080p, which is sometimes referred to as 2K, although 2K can also represent 
can be used to refer to 2048 across, which is what uh, commercial, commercial uh, DLP cinemas use. But in any event, we're talking about resolution. And the more resolution, the more pixels you have up on the screen, the sharper the image looks, as long as the source material has that much information in it. And what I was going to say was I've seen 4K, real 4K material projected on a, with a 4K projector, and I've also seen Blu-ray, 1920 by 1080, upscaled to 4K and shown on a 4K projector. And I have to say that that upscaled 1080p to 4K imagery doesn't look significantly better than when it's projected by a 2K projector. Uh, my experience has been it depends on the seating distance. So in the same way as the perforations in movie screens are usually invisible to 99% of the audience because they're sitting far enough back so that they're, the, the resolution of their optic nerve simply will not register that fine a definition. If mm -hmm. you sit too far back in the case, in my opinion, too far back in order to resolve the uh, fact that it's a 2K image or a 1080p, you're, you're not living in a, in a cinema world. In other words, the cinematographer, it, particularly with films made in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s, were designed, if they were widescreen, so that you would sit at such a distance that there would be a sense of panorama. And instead of just being limited to this area here, it really was much wider than I can display here. And, and you had to look left and to look right and be part of the process of the story unfolding. It wasn't a passive event at that time. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that's largely been lost because people come to accept the idea of sitting farther away from the screen so that the actual uh, size of the image uh, on their retina is about the same size as it would be if they were watching their 50 or 55 inch plasma or LCD <laughs> at the other end of the living room. Um, that is where TV and film, cinema, for me, diverge. And as a uh, both a still photographer and a cinematographer, you know, I, I take great exception to the fact that people uh, insist, uh, not so much that they shouldn't watch it in any form that they want, and even with bad aspect ratio and so forth, but if you haven't watched it at least once in the way in which it was intended, say Stanley Kubrick's 2001 up on a big 80 or 120 foot screen sitting in row J, I, I don't think you've really experienced the movie. Hmm. And there is a little anecdote here, which, which has been tossed around the uh, internet several times, and that came from David Lynch. And what he said was that if you think that you've ever seen one of my movies because you watched it on your cell phone, you're out of your mind. Because there's <laughs> Please, no we're, we're, we're a family show here. There is simply no way that what I put into that film as David Lynch is going to show up in your mind. Your eyes will not see the information. It's not coming through the display. You don't have the sound. The environment is all wrong. You've missed the whole point. You might as well be trying to read a very, very important book, let's say the Bible, while you're sitting and cooking and or doing something else. The, the entire effect is lost. And so I'm not quite as extreme as that, but I am <laughs> extreme about the fact that if you watch something like the these great films that keep coming uh, and going in history and showing up ever and ever again, even to the point now where um, the uh, Batman film of 1989 with uh, Michael Keaton is now coming back in reissue. Uh, and uh, and so is Back to the Future, which I believe is showing just, today. Ju just coming out on Blu-ray, that's right. Uh, and in fact, it's being shown in Lowe's theaters, uh, I believe That's today right. and, That's correct. and Wednesday. Today was the uh, 1230 showing, which I unfortunately had to miss. And Wednesday, <laughs> I believe, is the 730 showing. And what's going to happen, of course, is that if people go to that, what they're going to see is the way in which Steven Spielberg actually intended that film to look when he produced it, because it's going to be shown on a Sony 4K projector in all likelihood, uh, because it's not on film anymore. And yes, mm -hmm. it's the same transfer that will show up on Blue. Blu-ray, but I tell you that when you see it on the big screen and you look at it with 16-foot Lamberts, or at least 12, uh, it's going to look pretty substantial, a lot better That's, than it does on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to agree with you entirely, uh, and with David Lynch, <laughs> although I wouldn't use quite that language, that... Um, uh, we are vehement creatures. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the, uh, I'm not at all interested in watching movies on my cell phone. It's just not the, the experience I want when watching a movie. I'm with you. Um, and certainly filling your field of view with a Cinerama picture and sitting closer and so on, not too close, but 
closer than you than the image would occupy if you were sitting in, across your living room watching TV, is much more immersive, much more engaging, and much more um, representative of trying to replicate reality, as we've been talking about on this whole show. I have one more question before we go, and that is uh, from the chat room, uh, who asks, how long did it take you to build that room? And I know it's, it's, an, it's a work in progress, but how long have you been working on it? Uh, this particular installation started in 2003, shortly after both of my parents sadly passed away. Uh, and I was left with this incredible room, which my father had built in 1980 to house his musical instrument collection. And being a reviewer and an educator and a rank on tour, of course, he had lots of stuff to do with music, particularly about 125,000 LPs and 78s and musical manuscripts. And he also had nine keyboard instruments and wanted wow. to be able to not only house them, but be able to put on small concerts uh, for the uh, benefit of the local arts councils and whatnot. So the room was designed by a rather famous acoustician named Bern Dibner. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Bern Dibner. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, Joe Salerno, who worked almost exclusively for a, uh, a technical um uh, technically brilliant man named Bern Dibner, who is responsible for uh, the Burndy uh, library in Darien, Connecticut here, but also Burndy switches, which are used in just about every, uh, you know, lighting fixture in the known universe. Mm. Uh, and the bottom line is he... He had this great idea, he patented it, and he took all of his money and he gave it to this architect in order to build libraries where he could put on concerts, you know, and, and house the repository of knowledge for people to come in and listen to and enjoy for free. And when that uh, acoustician, Joe Salerno, came and built this room, that's the same goal that, that he started with, which is he wanted to have a place that was acoustically ideal for live music, but at the same time, it could totally control any kind of uh, recreated uh, or artificial sound and hmm. so the building materials are um, very specialized and the whole room is noise proof to the point where I can be running uh, full full tilt clips of Star Wars for example with peaks at 135 decibels you know at a meter from the drivers and you won't hear it at all outside of the house or or even on the other side of the house so wow. it's a it's one of the uh, one of the cornerstones again of my work is that I was gifted a room which, by its very uh, creation, begs the question: What does it take in order to make a perfect listening room, or at least one which doesn't do anything wrong? <laughs> and Incredible. that's not easy. Yeah, no, that's not easy at all. Uh, Jeremy Kipnis, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. This has been a fascinating conversation, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in one or another um, venue in the future, uh, maybe perhaps even your own room there. I'm so delighted. You must come as soon as you're in the area, and I include that as an invitation to anyone really wanting to have an opportunity to hear and see what it's like to live the mirage. <laughs> well, you can find out more about uh, Jeremy's studio and his work at his website, kipnis-studios.com. My online homes are ultimateavmag.com and uh, hometheatermag.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv and follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Christopher Huston, an acoustical engineer and a musician who grew up in Liverpool and played with John Lennon. He's got some fascinating stories to tell, and I'm sure looking forward to talking with him, and I sure hope you'll join me. Until then, geek out. <laughs>